This program is brought to you by the Center for a Sustainable Today. Our world is an amazing, complex living organism, and we coexist in a symbiotic relationship. With this great power comes a great responsibility, a responsibility to ensure the future by taking steps to be sustainable today. And now here are the hosts of Sustainable Today. Hello, and thanks for joining us on Sustainable Today, the show that helps you take action right now to become more sustainable, both at work and at home. Will Velota is out of town today, so I'm hosting solo with my guest, Buzz Chandler. He's the president of ASEAN Corporation in Portland, Oregon, to talk about plastics. So welcome to the show, Buzz. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you. Hey, um, how long have you been in the business of um, non-plastic plastics? Uh, about six years now, going on seven. Uh, we started here in Portland, um, and actually New Seasons Market was our very first customer. If they hadn't had some faith in us, uh, a lot of this would have never happened. So That's wonderful. Well, I'm glad that you're um, our guest today. And um, before I, I come back and learn about all these products that you have in front of us, because I'm anxious to learn, because I'm kind of confused about that compostable oh, yeah. plastics arena. Um, as I was preparing for the show today, I did discover some really interesting tidbits in the news. So in plasticnews.com, they report that according to a study, that was done by the nonprofit organization Ocean Conservancy. Plastic bags and food wrappers and containers are the second and the third most common items in marine debris. Now, of the 43 types of, of marine debris that's tracked, six of the top eight are plastics. Now, these calculations were based on a global one day beach collection conducted at 6,485 sites around the world in 104 countries, including 42 states and the District of Columbia right here in the United States. Now, 6.8 million pounds of trash were collected that day, and that's about 400 pounds for every mile of beach that they cleaned up. And 75% of that trash was those eight categories, including plastic bags, plastic wrappers, plastic containers, plastic bottles, plastic bottle caps, plastic straws and stirs, and plastic tablewares like this, um, knives, forks, spoons, and those kinds of things. Now, the study suggested that this problem is solvable s through simple measures like better public policies, reduced packaging, expanded recycling programs, and other waste reduction programs, as well as the proper disposal of waste. But when I looked into this a little bit uh, deeper, I found out that some of the marine debris does come from seafaring vessels and ocean platforms that lose or leave what they call derelict fishing gear, like fishing nets and fishing lines and crab pots, as well as just you know, basic trash. And cargo ships whose containers will sometimes you know, slip overboard. And you might remember the, the um, oh, I don't know, it was like 10,000 rubber ducks that yeah. went circling around the, the world a couple yeah. of years ago. Yep. Well, anyway, it's uh, estimated that about 80% of marine debris actually comes from land sources, not from, not from those other sources, but from land sources like urban runoff via storm drains, industrial discharge, litter, and blow-offs from poor waste collection practices, the hauling of garbage, and the landfills themselves. And of course, there's always the intentional dumping of waste into our lakes, rivers, and oceans, too. So plastics in the marine systems cause deadly entanglement and ingestion by birds, fish, and marine mammals. But uh, also, as these stories were saying, those plastics disintegrate, not biodegrade, they disintegrate in what's called microplastics. And plankton eat that up, and then that mi microplastic goes right on up the, ch the food chain, causing health issues along the way, including to us humans. Now, the Honolulu Weekly um, also reports that the plastics uh, containing bisphenol A, or BPA, are leaching it. And so some worry about uh, its health effects, such as claims of increased incidence of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, birth defects, and neurological damage. 
And the article also cited, and this is a little scary, um, that uh, BPA uh, also affects hormones in both marines and human populations, noting that it has caused male fish to turn into female fish in some areas of our uh, lakes and streams. Now, the Reuters news service uh, also confirmed those stories um, and said that some retailers are now phasing out plastic products that contain that BPA, such as what's in um, baby bottles and other liquid in containers because of that leaching. But, this is the ironic, uh, ironic thing, um, the FDA, as well as the plastic and foods packaging industries, defend the safety of BPA, while at the same time, they are looking for alternatives. So it's like, well, which is it? You defend it or you're looking for yeah. alternatives? So my concern is, is that um, they may just trade one toxic chemical, you know, BPA, for some other toxic chemical um, and not really solve the problem with plastic. So we'll just have to, you know, keep our eye on that and keep up with the news and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So now you probably know a whole lot about all of that, given your line of business, but um, but let me uh, let me um, start with the very beginning, which is when I hear the term plastics, even when I do this research, I think synthetic material. So we're here to talk about compostable plastics, and that just makes my head spin. So so how can plastics be compostable? So let's first start off with what is plastic? Plastic, the the real generic definition is a high polymer molecular structure that allows the substance to be malleable, it can be inject formed, it can be thermoformed, meaning you can take many shapes, you can make rods out of it, all kinds. It's, it's very flexible in what you can make out of it. Uh, that's one type of plastic, thermoformed plastic. The other one is called thermoset plastic it's a type of plastic that has, shall we say, a different mix of Merlin's mm -hmm. stew uh, that is very high temperature tolerant and is used in, in very high temperature applications. It won't melt, it won't break down. It's usually industrial type of applications. So there's the two basic type of plastics that are hydrocarbon based. The so there's still, so there's still plant based or, or um, hydrocarbon. hydrocarbon based, but, um, uh, but, but chemicals are added to them, I think like plasticizers and oh, there's, phthalates there's, or something like that. And oh, that's the, what makes them... Hundreds of thousands of different additives and mm -hmm. on top of that it just depends on how you mix them and when and, and mm -hmm. what they call mixing and in, in the industry it's called compounding. Uh, they, they mix up the resin that is injected or thermoformed to make the sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do with that and how you create the molecular structure of that various plastic can make it perform different ways or for different uses. Okay. It's, uh, it's but it's mo but it mostly is fossil fuel based oh hydrocarbons. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so that's the fundamental building block. Right. Okay. Now your company um, provides a host of compostable alternatives. That's to, all we do. To, to, to basic plastics. So, um, so we're going to get into that in, in a minute, but. Would you, would you talk a little bit about um, how you got into this business and why did you get into this business? Well, our, our company was involved in, in a, a little bit different line of work. We were more into frozen seafood processing with a partner of ours in Asia. Um, we would source seafood here and ship it over there and it was processed into food products. But um, seafood in general, the, the, the oceans are being overfished and none of us in the office we were sitting around one day having a little staff meeting. Didn't feel right about this. Yeah. And one of our staff members said, you know, um, I've got some stuff in the sample room there, and it was, turned out to be some sugarcane products. And uh, this was new. There was none on the market here. Uh, so we just said, well, let's do a little marketing study. And we uh, started calling around and sending a few emails just to some actual retailers see if there was like a market interest in it. Well, make a long story short, Brian Rohr, who uh, founded New Seasons Market, sent an email back and it was flagged saying, you've got something we're really interested in. Can you get over here this afternoon? So and that's what started you. Yep, and that's what started us. Cool. Well, so um, so compostable plastics. The One of the things I've noticed is um, 
is, and I'm going to just show this right here, and, and that is this, um, it's called PLA7. I, I get kind of confused by all the numbers. So what's, what is PLA7, and why is it compostable but not recyclable? Okay. Seven is the, na the international symbol for other plastics. If you look on a lot of your plastic, uh, like a soap jug or a water bottle or something like that, you'll see a little triangle with arrows, and inside of it will be like a one, two, three, four, five, six, and then a seven. The first six numbers all are specific to a certain type of plastic. Seven is how the International Standard Organization lumped everything else, and they have yet to come up with the same sort of system for the various plastics that might be compostable or partially compostable. So everything is falling into the seven right now. Oh, I see, okay. Now PLA itself stands for polylactic acid and it's derived from plant sugars, dextrose. So the PLA right at this moment, you can, if it's marked compostable, you can compost it. Yeah. Otherwise, what do you do with Most, that? If you see something that's marked that is PLA, you can be 99.99% .99 sure it is compostable. Okay. But for most PLA products, it needs to go to a commercial composter because the temperature sensitivity of it is a little bit uh, more than what the average person can do in their backyard composter. Uh, it can be done, and people who are very diligent about it uh, said they have great success with it. But, you know, most of us, we have busy schedules and everything. We can't get out there every day or once a week and turn it properly and, and this sort of thing. So the clear PLA, the solid PLAs, they need to go to a commercial composting facility. But it's still a step in the right direction because there was a recent figure that came out that the United States, for permitted landfill space, only has 21 years of landfill space left in the entire oh, country. Oh, my, yeah. So we need to get hopping on on commercial compost right. facilities. And what yeah. people need to understand about most landfills is that they are called anaerobic, which means they are completely sealed like the mummy's tomb. Yeah. Nothing gets in, nothing gets okay. out. Well, that was one of my questions I was going to ask you later, but since we're on it right now, is so if I put this into, um, even though it's compostable, and I put it into my trash, which goes to the landfill, what happens to it? It'll partially degrade when they're still sort of burying it. But once that landfill is sealed, everything stops. It doesn't matter whether it's compostable or a biodegradable claim or if it's a sheet of paper. They've pulled up hot dogs that are 20 years old and they look good enough to eat. <laughs> so a landfill is meant to be sealed and they don't want it to collapse. If it was composting in there, the landfill would collapse. You'd have all sorts of leaching of, of very toxic substances. So they're made to hold themselves. Oh, to hold and stay in. Yeah. Okay, so unless I know that I can get this into a commercial um, composting facility, I, I might make a different choice. Maybe, maybe. Now, I, I, now I have another uh, question for you around, because um, not everything has labels. And so I've gotten what has been called compostable uh, paper products. And it, and it will have a coating in here. And I always understood that if it has a coating, it's not compostable. So what, could you help clarify that sure. mystery? Paper by itself is naturally compostable. Mm -hmm. Any kind of paperboard, cardboard, anything like that. So that part is right. Now the film lining on it is probably uh, a PETE, polyethylene, uh, or similar type film that's been laminated on there, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they're not putting any markings on it. Yeah, I hate it when there's no markings because then I don't know what to do. The, there's a rule of thumb. If okay. there's no markings, figure it's the worst thing possible because those of us in the compostable industry for, for tableware and, uh, and similar that are BPI approved and have real compostable plastics. We're letting everybody know it's right there on, on the label. Yes, like right here. And yeah. You're saying it very clearly. I mean, you're compostable. Yeah, in fact, in right. San Francisco, in San Jose, and Oakland, uh, their the cities are actually pushing to have that green stripe on there for easy identification. Great. And also for when it's in the waste stream, it's easy to extract and compost. Oh, excellent, because when, when things are going down those chutes, 
yeah. workers can say, ah, there's that green stripe. Yeah. That would be a yeah. fabulous standard to put in place. Yeah. Jack Macy, who's the head of the San Francisco Department of the Environment, has been a real uh, you know, sort of stalwart for that. And, and we can credit him with sort of, you know, keeps breaking down the barriers to, to get something like this. So mm -hmm. tip of the hat to him. Absolutely. Now, there are a lot of different um, um, products that you can use for composting. Because you mentioned um, one. There's also um, coconut husks. Oh yeah, you know, and you know, sugar cane and corn. So, what's what's better and what's worse? Well, the best things would be things that are natural fiber based. Uh, something like uh, this, which is a sugar cane fiber that we produce. Uh, the fiber that we use is actually when they crush the sugar cane to get the sugar juice to make food. This is a waste fiber. It's the first thing to come off. So, mm -hmm. we take that fiber and do what's called a molded paper, and uh, most people don't know that sugarcane was used uh, back in the times of the Egyptians for paper. It's been around a long, long time, longer than wood paper, wood pulp. So we take that. It's it's uh, pre-consumer, 100% recycled fiber, and make it into a board, and then we make our products with it. Uh, in testing, uh, we've composted in as quick as 21 to 30 days, and it's it, the sugarcane, or you'll see. Uh, wheat straw, some of those like there, uh, or some of the recycled ones like Chinette brand is uh, primarily a wood pulp. But all of those will break down in your home composter. Oh, I, all of these, all of these, all of these with a natural fiber great, that are that great. do not have a film liner on them. Mm -hmm. uh, th they'll all break down. The only suggestion uh, that you should do is tear them up a little bit so that they're in smaller pieces. Okay. Uh, we did some testing and. Uh, I would say sort of in a non-scientific way, but uh, we threw some in my azalea bed in early February. It was freezing outside. Right. Second week of March, we went back and we'd even staked it, and all we found were two pieces the size of a quarter. That's great. And okay. that was in this, cold conditions. I think this is the product that I need to be buying yeah. instead yeah. of this other stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come back and we'll, we'll talk a sure. more about compostable uh, products. But the argument is made by most plastic makers is that their plastics are recyclable. Now, while some plastics are indeed recyclable, the market for these has really plummeted um, because of the economy. And that's been resulting in more plastic being shunted off to landfills. Now, there are fewer and fewer companies willing to take plastics off of our hands. But one continues its commitment. That's Far West Fibers. They'll take rigid plastic, plastic bottles, the dreaded plastic bags, and more. So let's find out uh, uh, what they're doing about plastics in this month's Business Spotlight. Well, I held my nose and I dumped out the bag. I separated what I could from the crusty dish rag. I took the long green goobers to the compost heap. I was thrashing in the trash, I was in the deep. The papers and cans, every bit of that glass, it got recycled right on out of that trash. Oh, recycled, it's a bit of Jeff Murray from Far West Fibers in Hillsboro, Oregon, one of the largest processing, recycled processing plants in the Northwest. Can you tell me a little bit about what your company does? Yes, we receive the material that you leave off of the curb. It's picked up by a truck similar to this. We sort the material, we bulk it up, and ship it out to various recycling markets. That sounds like quite a process. Let's go take a look. Sure. The process starts in two different locations. One is the hauler bringing the material from the curb. And the second is at our public depots. Far West Fibers operates seven public depots in the Portland metropolitan area. And that is where we take those types of plastics that we don't like to see in the commingle that just don't work with the commingle. And by commingle, you mean? The material that you put in that bin at the curb, that's all mixed together, newspaper, cardboard, plastics, tin, aluminum. That material is then run across the sort line where mechanically and with hands, the material is separated the various grades of paper, plastics, metals. All that came in from the curbs, that's all residential. People won't put anything in a roll cart, won't they? That's nothing, we get lawnmowers, we get, see this bag? <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, now we're here to find out what's up. The idea of the roll cart is not that you just put anything in there that you believe can be recycled. It's important to understand put the wrong thing in there, it could mess up 
all the good material that you put in there that we do want in that mix. Best example I have, plastic bags. And over the last few years, more and more of that material is showing up at the, in the curb, in the bins. And today we pull out about one to two tons a shift of those plastic bags. And if you think how light a plastic bag is, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of plastic bags a day. We have to shut our equipment down every two and a half hours to clean out what we call our screens, which is the mechanical method of uh, separating some of these materials because the plastic film wraps up in the wheels of these screens. So we actually have to have people climb in with box cutting knives. And it's probably close to a third of the cost of labor on our sort line is cleaning up the equipment due to plastic film. We also at our public depots accept plastic bags and plastic film. So not just the bag, but as an example, the wrap around toilet paper, that type of material we can take at the depots. And they will be recycled, but it's extremely important that people understand it does not go to the curb. Glass bottles in the mix. Glass is very recyclable. It's great to recycle it. It's very difficult to get the glass out of the paper. And when that does happen, it's difficult to market that glass because it's so broken and mixed. So that's why in the state of Oregon, you're asked to keep glass on the side. And that's extremely important to do. Let's talk a little bit about the volume of plastic and how much it's grown in possibly the last 10 years. We've expanded some of the materials that we do accept at the curb that are plastic. An example is three years ago, flower pots, you know, the plastic pots that you buy your plants in, um, that was garbage. And today, it's a part of the curbside material. And we're, we're looking at other types of materials as well that have long-term markets. A material that's grown quite a bit recently is what a term we use, rigid plastics. And rigid plastics are things such as the old curbside bin that you would recycle with laundry hampers, kids' waiting pools, kids' toys that are all plastic. And all of that tends to show up in the curbside. We don't want it to show up. It's a hassle to handle. At times it's somewhat dangerous, especially when it's big and bulky and comes onto the system. We are able to recycle that material. And we do accept, once again, we accept that type of material at our public depots. Plastic Roundup events were very popular, and now we see those being canceled due to overloading with material, the market being slightly soft, and the increase in labor and what it costs to actually process that. The Roundups were meant to get the material that couldn't go to the curb. Last October of 08, we saw the markets absolutely fall apart in a matter of days. The value of plastics went to about 10% of what it was in, about, in a period of a month. And certain types, like clamshells, etc., there was no market for it. The film plastic bags, we had no market for for a period of time. The only material that we've had to landfill that we've recovered is, are those plastic bags for a period of a month. We just didn't have the room to store. So let's talk a little bit about the market. Who are we selling to and what kind of materials are they looking for? What are they not looking for? And where do you think the greatest improvement can come from that? The, our primary markets are news markets. Historically, newspaper was 70% of our material at the curb up until a year ago. Today it's less than 50 percent, but it's still the primary material at the curb. That is one of our biggest focuses is the quality of the newspaper that we're selling to these markets because it is such a large volume. And the news mills have adapted to handling different types of materials. Before they only wanted newspaper as newspaper, magazines, magazine, they didn't want any other papers. They're no longer just making newspaper. A lot of these mills are trying to survive and they're adapting. And as an example, um, Blue Heron in Oregon City, they make bags for McDonald's and they have other products that are non-news that they take the newspaper they get, turn it into a different product. The mill we work with in Longview, Norpac, they make a number of different products, whether it's paper for paperback books or what have you. So, but they. It's extremely important for them that we make sure there's no glass in there and that there's no brown fiber because the brown fiber will blend in with the newspaper fiber and cause them a lot of problems. The other major material we sell is brown fiber on the paper. And brown fiber can be broken up into multiple grades. There is what we call OCC, old corrugated container. That truly is brown fiber, sometimes with a white top. We also have a 
secondary grade of brown fiber. That's where your cereal boxes and shoe boxes and the carrier board that your pop might have come in. That is the primary material that we, a, a paper, that's the primary material that we export. A lot of the plastics go overseas to facilities overseas where they may be further sorted and then granulated and made back into plastic products. Within Oregon, we have a reasonably high recovery rate of plastic bottles compared to other parts of the country, but it's still not a big number, 25 to 30 percent. But then when you take into account all plastics, all of a sudden the amount of recovered plastics is historically somewhere around 5 percent because there's all these other materials. We've made some pretty dramatic changes in what we take, the toys and the the buckets and old roll carts and what what have you that just a few years ago there was no market for. Right. As an example, either water bottle or milk jug. The water bottle is made in layers, so you can actually take that PET water bottle and recycle it and they can use it in the inner layer that doesn't have actual contact with the material within the container. You can actually take a water bottle and recycle it back into potentially a water bottle. What's interesting is for years, a lot of your carpet's been made out of PET bottles, whether really? it's Coke or Pepsi or what have you. Um, fleece coats. No uh, way. Yeah, lots of clothing is made out of PET. It's incredible. A lot of kids' toys have re contain recycled plastic. Mm -hmm. um, a big one that's really taken off over the last number of years is lumber, especially for decking and that. Plastic film also can go back and go back into, but can be made into, lumber with other materials and intermixed. the styrofoam. Evil. <laughs> styrofoam is probably the number one challenge material in the area of plastics. And the reason is its weight, the lack of weight. It is actually now recyclable. If you can bulk it up and make a weight with that material, there's markets that'll pay a decent price for the material. The problem is you see the big, long 53-foot uh, tractor trailer rigs going down the highway, you can get about a thousand pounds of styrofoam in that truck in bags. A normal truck that we send to market will have 27 tons of material in it. The transportation of the styrofoam is the biggest issue. There are two companies in the Portland area that do accept styrofoam. One is Total Reclaim, which is located out on Northeast Columbia Boulevard. And another one is Pacific Land Clearing. They're another type of dirty MRF. They're located in North Portland. And they will accept it. We are looking at accepting that material in Beaverton when we fully reoccupy during the next year. In the future, Far West Fibers actually sees less material at the curb because we see less material. There's going to be less and less newspaper. We look at our mission as we receive we separate, we bulk up, we market. A few years ago, we entered into receiving electronics, and so we're adapting our business to be able to deal with that. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking time out of your day today. We definitely got to see what happens from the recycling world once it leaves the home. Thanks so much. Thank you. This is Holly Fee bringing you the tools to be sustainable today. Well, it seems pretty obvious that the best way to keep plastics out of the environment is to not use them in the first place. But if um, plastics are an inevitable fact of life, and I think they might be, at least for a good long while, then it's good to know that there are ways to minimize its use, or at least to compost some of it, which is why we're talking with you today, Buzz. But all compostable plastics are not equal. No, they're not. So tell me uh, kind of uh, what the differences are between some of the composting mechanisms. PLA right now is probably the foremost compostable plastic. Uh, it's made by NatureWorks back in Blair, Nebraska. Uh, it's certified by the BPI, Biodegradable Products Institute, a third party certification. Mm -hmm. They're very good. There's some others out there. There's one called Myrol, uh, a few others, Seroplast. However, there's a lot of the, shall we say, the old school plastics industry that does see that their industry is, is under threat in various ways. And they're coming up with uh, a lot of what they call biodegradable or oxodegradable plastics. Mm -hmm. Now the oxodegradable says, or the theory is, is that they'll break down with a lot of sunlight. Well, that's true, but they only break down from, say, the bag 
into very small bits. The, the resins and everything, they don't go away. So actually you end up with, in a, in a way, of polluting whatever's around with more of a sand type product than the, than the bag. It's kind of like those, it's that little ma macro or microplastics that I was talking You're about right. earlier. That's what yeah. happens. Mm -hmm. And then there's been a lot of biodegradable claims, but biodegradable is an empty term. It doesn't mean anything. It just happens to have been a word that caught on in the vernacular of the, of the public eye. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything under the sun, everything in this studio, er everything you can see is biodegradable. You just got to give it enough, <laughs> enough time, time. <laughs> right. and it breaks right. down. Right. Compostable is really what the new standard is coming out to be because the products go through an actual chemical change. There's a carbon change in them. And that's the reason we came up with the name of our, our products of stock market is because we're starting with the stock of a plant. We take the raw materials, make it value added for the marketplace. It composts into humus or new soil. A new stock comes up. So that's kind of the little, you that's know, great. life cycle analysis. And these compostable plastics are the same way. So and, and it sounds like that can get certified. The fact that your compostable yes. does get certified. So that's great. The, I would say all the viewers out there, if you're worried about, if you're whatever you're using, is it the real thing? If you can get online, find out what certifications they have. Is it from a respected organization? Now, in the United States, BPI is, is the highest level you can get. Okay. Federal Trade Commission, U.S. Federal Trade Commission, relies on BPI for false claims or, or certifying them. So they're they're really above board. You don't have like a little sticker on your yes, on do. your labeling that shows right it. Right there. Great. So so you're looking for that little symbol right there, or something like that. Yes, it's yeah. you know, usually what it, the the sort of the nickname for it in the industry is the chasing arrows. Wonderful. Okay, I was at a picnic uh, one time and I got these plastic um, compostable plastic little forks. Right. Unfortunately, um, as I started to eat my hot dish, you know the the fork began to melt. Uh, the plate, however, you know stayed, but the fork melted. So what what's that all about? How come? That, has it, and has it been resolved, that heat resistance issue? Yes, it has. Okay. Those, there's, there's some still on the market, uh, but those are essentially first generation bioplastics. Mm. And the first generation, like even traditional plastics when they were first coming out right after World War II, had tremendous heat issues. Uh, traditional plastics now have got about a 60 year legacy and there's always been research and development so they're getting better and better and better and better from a quality standpoint. Bioplastics have been around about eight to ten years. They're still really in their infancy. So the first generation were not very heat tolerant, about 90 to 100 degrees and they'd deform. Uh, I've seen people put a spoon in a cup of coffee and pull it out and the end of the spoon is gone. <laughs> But like now, the, hopefully there's uh, nothing bad in there, and you no, can just drink uh, that coffee, right? Because yeah, there, there shouldn't it's, be. It's all it's all natural but stuff. Like the uh, cutlery there, its its basis is potato starch, and it's actually heat tolerant up to about 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Which, if you're eating anything at 180, it's 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 red hot. It's yeah, that's yeah. too too hot to put in my mouth anyway. But the, that's second generation. The third generation is now coming on the market. We're introducing a new cutlery that's uh, PLA based called crystallized PLA. It's much more heat tolerant. It looks much more like a traditional plastic utensil, but we found that it actually breaks down faster than the starch one in composting. Um, and, and again, I'm noticing these don't say compostable, which probably would be a good thing to add because how would you know unless you see it? Right, and yeah. that's one of the things that uh, all the manufacturers who have like a BPI rating or in Europe it's called Dinserto or OK Compost, mm -hmm. uh, Japan is called Japan Pla. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all moving in the, in the forward with marking the goods good. so that the public can you know knows it but there's a way to on our websites or through an industry uh, sort of clearinghouse, I don't know, maybe not clearinghouse, but like BPI or something. Yeah. BPI lists everybody who's certified right on their website and it oh, answers good. a lot okay. of questions for Great. people. I would suggest to go there. Wonderful, that sounds good. Well, I, I got a, a question. Even though these are compostable, um, you're, you're still using it once and tossing it away, although in this case it biodegrades. So really how sustainable is that? Because it, it still is that use once, toss away mentality. We Americans are spoiled. We like doing that, uh, more or less for convenience. Uh, 
it will take some attitude change. Some people are now advocating like carrying a canteen, you know, for your bottled water or you know, when you're out walking. Uh, grabbing a hot cup of coffee, eh, I don't know, you're gonna make it at home and, and, and carry it around with you. Uh, there's a lot of people just because of the way their daily life is, it's impractical to carry that around. And it's just ingrained in our society. So probably what we have to do is a little bit of a lifestyle change to get our city fathers and others to, to come up with better systems of, of the waste management system. Although with the clear PLAs, if you're just talking liquids and everything, you can rinse them and use them several times. I wouldn't suggest going too long because they are a bit more porous than porcelain or stainless steel. But you can rinse them and, and reuse them. Right. And I actually, I have done that with some yeah. of the PLAs that I've gotten. Yeah, but just a few times and you go, mm, might might be yeah. time to, to, to move it on. Now, I, I think you just got a, a carbon trust certification. So it's like you're even trying to make sure that um, your products have a, a small footprint, but even your business. So, you yeah, know, that's one way that that's one reason why you might want to use compostables with a company that's mindful of that. Yes, uh, more and more people are asking, you know, what's your LCA life cycle analysis or your carbon footprint, mm -hmm. and it's still that is really still in its infancy. Uh, some of the studies we've seen have only taken a small portion of the products, sort of transit from raw material to end use. But on the other hand, we've seen uh, some makers like uh, Sara Lee is a good example. They're working with the Carbon Trust on some of their uh, microwave products for the home. They're going from the farm where the food's grown to the packaging to the manufacturing all the way into the consumer using it in their microwave oven. What's the carbon footprint? And that's a daunting task. And, it, now, and is that what you're uh, attempting yeah. to do as well? Is that full we've already life done, cycle? For our sugar cane, we've already done the study. It took us two years and we were just certified a few weeks ago. The only other two companies in the United States that have had any of their products certified by Carbon Trust is Pepsi-Cola with their Minute Maid orange juice and Coca-Cola with one of their uh, orange juice products. Uh, so it, it's really at the cutting edge, although Europe, it's much, much farther ahead of us. They're, it, it's coming to the United coming States. Here. Well, you're on the, on the cutting edge of that then as well. You're, you're a real uh, trailblazer, well, it seems you. like, yep. in this product. I have a, one more question here, because it, it seems like um, the compostable plastics typically are at a higher price than your regular fossil-based you know, plastic products right now. So um, why is that, and what can be done to, to make it even more price competitive? It's pretty much just supply and demand and, and the volume available. Uh, as the industry continues to grow, the pricing is coming down or staying uh, much more steady. Uh, I can tell you that uh, a year ago when oil was pushing five dollars a barrel, uh, our clear plastic cups were less than traditional plastic oh, cups. Oh, sure. And we would never raised our price. There was a very small adjustment for some freight charges, but uh, we never had to raise our price. And our competition who does the basic hydrocarbon type plastics was way ahead of us. And then the oil crashed and they dropped their prices so they went back down. But overall, there's more and more production capability coming online. That's driving the price down. There's becoming more competition. The pricing is getting much, much closer. And right now, there is not that much difference. You should The average consumer should be able to go out and find compostable products that are very close in price with traditional ones. Great. Thank you. Now, around 100 billion petroleum-based plastic bags are used each year at checkout stands across the United States. And that requires about 12 million barrels of oil each year as well. Only 5% of those bags get recycled, and the rest end up in landfills, or worse, in the ocean. The Surfrider Foundation is leading a campaign to ban the bag in order to protect our world's oceans, waves, and beaches. And as a bonus, to reduce the use of fossil fuels. Several cities have already taken such actions, such as um, San Francisco and Oakland. Now, Surfrider's Portland chapter has made this their top priority.
in the open ocean, graceful dolphins glide beneath the surface in pursuit of fish, their primary food. These fish, in turn, feed on minute, prolific creatures called zooplankton. These days, zooplankton share the surface waters with increasing numbers of minute plastic particles, posing a problem since fish and birds are now consuming plastic in addition to plankton. Since petroleum-based plastics are non-biodegradable, any plastic entering the ocean remains there, continually breaking into ever smaller pieces until it becomes ingested or is deposited on some distant shore. Hi, my name is Charlie Plyvin. I'm the Oregon Field Coordinator for Surfrider Foundation. And I'm Trisha Ratliff from the Oregon Coast Aquarium. And today we are here at the South Jetty in South Beach, just south of Newport, and we're here to do a little demonstration beach cleanup project with some of the kids from the aquarium. So guys, are you ready to hit the beach and learn a little bit more about plastics and how plastics are impacting our beaches and our oceans? Yes, we are. All right, let's go. Surfrider Foundation is a, a grassroots volunteer-based organization and we work on ocean and coastal conservation, uh, keeping our waters clean, uh, keeping our beaches protected, uh, protecting public access uh, for the shoreline. Uh, and so one of the big issues with our oceans is marine debris, uh, especially plastics. So um, our Portland chapter decided about a year and a half ago that they wanted to try and urge uh, the city of Portland to uh, pass a ban on single-use plastic bags because a lot of those bags end up in the watershed. Uh, some of them end up in the ocean as well. For a lot of our volunteers in Oregon, we do beach cleanups pretty regularly. One of the number one items that you'll see on the beach is plastics. And so, you know, it's a good feeling to go out and do a beach cleanup and, and pick up a bunch of plastic, but you feel like you're not addressing the root of the problem. Uh, and then you come back to Portland and you see just the amount of single-use plastics that are consumed some of that, of course, makes its way into the ocean. So I think for our Portland chapter, this was a, a great way of taking sort of a, a tangible issue, a bite-sized issue, and saying, you know, we can get behind this and we can get the city of Portland uh, to try and shift consumer behavior away from the single-use plastics. All right, thank you. <laughs> We're going to send this uh, to city council uh, this fall. Uh, we have about 4,000 folks so far that have signed on in support. And the idea of the ban is just getting people to, instead of using the single-use plastic bags, use reusable bags. What do you know about the problem with plastic bags? I know, <laughs> I know that they're uh, taking up valuable landfill space, and they're also pretty harmful to different animals and uh, wildlife and things that um, the token hazard or end up getting all tied up in them and everything. So I you know it's not a good thing. Well, I know that they're not recyclable and that the, um, we use more in a day that like covers some large swath of the planet. Um, but in particular, not all the facts off of that. The Central Pacific Gyre's gentle maelstrom accumulates debris from all over the Pacific and concentrates it in two enormous eddy systems east and west of the International Dateline. The expedition to the gyre was a, was a three-week uh, adventure. It took a week to get out there, a week to do work, and a week to get back. Now, our week out there was a full-time job. We're working sun up to sundown. We were trawling the ocean surface to find small bits of, of plastic. We were tracking down buoys. We would see like a plastic buoy or a plastic object in the ocean, and we'd all work together to go turn the boat around and go retrieve it. And here's a net right here that we found. The big ones can be up to five tons, massive nets that are all tangled up, full of rope and bits of netting. These nets, all those different kinds of rope, they're different kinds of plastic. I'm the education consultant for the Algalita Marine Research Foundation. I interact with teachers and students all the time. Prior to the Jara voyage, I would talk about 
the problem of plastics in the oceans. But I hadn't really seen it myself until the expedition to the gyre. This is a good sample for chemical analysis. One paper that was written that said that there's over a million times more pollutants that's absorbed by the plastic than what's in the ambient seawater. Like these plastic particles are magnets for those, those pops, those persistent organic pollutants. As captain of the oceanographic research vessel Algita, I've traveled to many remote areas of the Pacific Ocean. And in my travels, I've been alarmed at the increase in the amount of trash. My sentiment was that the ocean is filling up with trash. To try to get a handle on the quantity of trash in the ocean, we trawled over 100 kilometers at random lengths and then came back to the lab and analyzed our samples. We compared the weight of the plastic pieces that we accumulated in these trawls to the weight of the zooplankton that we accumulated. And most people find it highly distressing to learn that for every six pounds of plastic that we got, there was only one pound of plankton. In other words, there's six times more plastic by weight in this area than there is naturally occurring plankton. However, the Central Pacific, being a gyre, does accumulate. The high concentrations we found are likely to be at their greatest in the center of the Central Pacific gyre. All right, guys, so what we're doing here is we're picking up um, a little bit of trash on the beach, but I want you guys to focus in a very small area. We're going to be looking at plastic and how it accumulates on the beach, and then we want to start to think about how it gets here. And one of the things that I really want you guys to look for, when you start to look at the sand, when you start to look at all the things that are on the beach, and you start to look really, really close, look for these little round balls, these tiny little round balls. I'm going to get one close up there. These are called nurdles. These are plastic nurdles, and this is pre-production plastic. What does that mean? It's not melted down yet. It's not melted down yet. It hasn't actually turned into a product yet. So we're finding plastic nurdles, stuff that is intended to be used as a product one day. We're starting to find these things on our beaches. Some Japanese scientists released a study indicating that plastic pellets, the manufactured way that uh, plastics are shipped to end-use manufacturers. Uh, these plastic pellets are accumulators of uh, hydrophobic uh, pollutants, things like DDE, PCB. These can be up to a million times more concentrated on the surface of these plastic pellets than they are in the ambient seawater based on this latest research. So we're looking at a situation in which uh, it's not innocent uh, confetti that's being spilled out in the ocean. It's a very effective biotoxin accumulator that's drifting around out there. Let's take a look. So we basically covered an area about this big. And you guys still see some plastic that we may not have picked up? Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think of all this plastic that we picked up here today? It's, disgust it's disgusting. It's disgusting, huh? Yeah, it's just... So, let's just not think about it being disgusting, though. What's something that we can do? What's one thing? Tell me one thing that you're going to do. Well, uh, recycle and also tell people about what it can do to like our beaches and our animals. It's a good indicator of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and everything out there. Definitely. I have a friend who doesn't recycle, and so I might try and convincing her parents to start recycling. That's a great start. Single-use plastics are ubiquitous, you know? I mean, really, we're, we're scratching the surface when you talk about the plastic grocery bag. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to Sustainable Today. And remember, we are bringing you the tools to be sustainable today.
Now, I've not been able to completely banish plastics from my life and my household. In fact, it would be kind of hard, hard to do that. And durable plastic containers and other kinds of plastic items can be quite useful. Uh, here's this month's Go Green with Jean that explores some of the options for your daily choices when it comes to using plastics. <music> Plastics are everywhere. Just take a look around my office and what do you find? Here's a vinyl mat, or polyvinyl chloride to be exact, with foam rubber on the back so it doesn't slip. Foam rubber is an airy kind of polyurethane plastic and it's everywhere too. Like in the seat cushion of my chair and the padding under the rug. The adhesive sticking these layers together, it's probably an epoxy, another kind of plastic, acrylics, acetates, nylons, polyesters, polyethylenes, and polystyrenes, the list of plastics goes on and on. According to Waste Online, nearly 100 million tons of plastics are produced each year. Most pens nowadays are made of plastics. Old-time pens were made of feathers, which held the ink. At least those were compostable at the end of their life. But what am I supposed to do when the ink runs out of this disposable pen? Well, I pull mine apart and then I can recycle the tubes and the caps, but I just got to toss out these into the trash. Did you know that almost 100% of plastics are recyclable, but only 7% of plastics are recycled in the U.S.? Only half of the communities in the U.S. have recycling programs. Now, this computer's mostly made of plastic parts, and luckily here in Oregon, we can recycle our computers, monitors, and TVs in the e-waste program. I can take old cables and wiring to Far West Fibers. They'll strip the copper from the plastic casings. Let's see, file trays, this floor mat, that uh, plastic coated binding, those CDs, those cassette cases, uh, that little coaster there. I got that for doing something spectacular where I used to work. I don't remember what. No, 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 not that award. That's glass. It was from a classic ballroom competition. I had the second place stickers on the back. It's hard to avoid plastics altogether, but I can make better decisions about it. For example, I keep a few name tags handy to reuse. I especially like this one. It was made just for me. It has my favorite colors on it. I opt for products that have less plastic packaging if I have a choice. And I leave plastic hangers at the store so that they can reuse them. I avoid buying anything with these plastic green bindings. And if you have any of them, then clip the rings. That way you can avoid any kind of animal entanglement. It's unbelievable how we still mismanage our trash and kill countless birds, fish, and other wildlife with plastics. Don't get me started. Durable plastic containers are great for food storage, but if you buy a container with something that's not food, then don't reuse it for food. It's not likely food grade plastic and therefore chemical compounds can leach into the food. Plastic containers made for only one use should only be used once. Otherwise, those polymers can break down and seep into the food or water like this bottle. I try not to buy any of those in the first place. Instead of using plastic wrap, which gets tossed after a single use, I store almost all my food in lidded containers. If I do use wrap, well then I clean it after I use it, and I recycle it at a grocery store with other filmy plastic bags. They're the same kind of resin. For anything acidic, I store that in glass containers. Acid can etch plastic, and you guessed it, that can leach into your food. Yeesh. This is ready to recycle. I don't use plastic dishes in the microwave either. The concern is chemicals leaching out due to the high heat. I use glass dishes instead. I bought these glass lids real cheap at a thrift store for glass bowls that I already had. Shh, don't tell anybody. But when I don't feel like cooking, I heat up a frozen entree like this, one that has a paper container, not plastic. I wish these were compostable after I was done. But I can recycle this plastic outer layer, and this company does use a recyclable frozen box. That's nice. For picnics, I use durable plastics, 
not paper plates and plastic forks that are tossed out into the trash and wind up in the landfill. My friend, Dr. Judith, is a no-on-nonstick gal. She's concerned about the perfluorooctanoic acid. You say that three times, otherwise known as C8. It's a chemical that's used to bind the nonstick coating to the metal. Most research shows that it's best just to be cautious. Use nonstick pots and pans only on low temperatures and just get rid of it as soon as it's scratched or if you see any signs of the coating wearing off. I prefer these metal clad copper bottom pans. This is one of my dad's pans from way back when. When plastic credit cards make it in through junk mail, well, I just cut them up into my plastic pile for recycling. Most of the plastics that can't be recycled curbside in the metro area can be recycled at Farbus Fibers. Two simple sorts. Filmy, you know, plastic wrap and bags. And the other for all this rigid plastic stuff. How easy is that? And by the way, no more disposable plastic pens for me. I only invest in refillables. I'm Jean Bauman, bringing you the tools to be sustainable today. I'm an everyday gal, making my everyday choices count. And you can too. Hmm, I wonder where this came from. I don't mean to keep the pens that I borrow. Is this one yours? I'm uh, feeling a bit more hopeful about uh, plastics. <laughs> so. I really want to uh, thank you, Buzz, for coming on the show t today. It's been super helpful. It's, you've definitely decreased my confusion factor oh, around uh, compostable plastics. Um, now, that's it for our show today. And to learn more about the Center for Sustainable Today events and projects, please visit our website at sustainabletoday.org. And to learn a bit more about uh, Buzz's business, uh, you can go to that uh, same website for uh, links to, uh, to your organization. I'm Jane Bauman asking you to make every choice count, both at work and at home, as you become more sustainable today. Thank you, Buzz. It's been a great pleasure. Oh, my pleasure's all mine. Thank you. In the sky. It's my home. It's where I live. You and many others live here too. The earth is our home. It's where we live. We can feel the power of the noonday sun, a blazing ball of fire up above, shining light and warmth enough for everyone, a gift to every nation from a star. It's a big, beautiful planet in the sky. It's my home. It's where I live. Others live here too. The earth is our home. It's where we.